Ladies and gentlemen in the audience, uh, we are going live on YouTube at the moment, so uh, it's your, it's your, it's your proper manners. <laughs> well, the meeting is not being called to order, of course. <laughs> Okay, so it is 5 p.m. on Tuesday, June 21st, 2022, and this is the Town of Lake Cowichan Annual General Meeting. And before we start, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that we are uh, holding this meeting on the traditional unceded territories of the Subasa, that's people of the lake, uh, our local First Nation, where we happily live together as neighbors. And with that, I would call this meeting to order. And this meeting is being held at Lake Couch Fire Department, Fire Hall 3 North Shore Road, Lake Couch in BC, also being transmitted uh, via the OWL in front of us. Um, very interesting device that uh, takes the guesswork out of camera and microphone work. So it's great to have that. And it's broadcast on the town of Lake Cowichan YouTube channel. So with that, I'll call this meeting to order. Um, so the first item on the agenda is Mayor, uh, welcome remarks and presentation of the annual report for the town of Lake Cowichan. So I'd just like to say, um, start off by saying some 25 years ago when I moved to this town, and I, some of you may have be tired of hearing this story, it said Boomtown or Ghost Town. And it, it, we moved here because the uh, uh, very uh, cost of living was cheaper than anywhere else. Family wasn't that well off at the time. And, and a lot of that was a symptom of it wasn't doing well, the economy of Lake College. And I'm very happy to say if you, that now if you read through our annual report, um, we're living in a very vibrant community and that's what we've been aiming for for 25 some odd years now. And uh, I think we're here and now we need to manage what's going on um, better than we ever have before because we're, we're being uh, inundated with development all around us from, from everywhere. Um, even the stuff that doesn't occur within the town is occurring outside the town that relies on our services. So we have to be very careful how we how we uh, move forward and do our financing. So our staff does a great job um, doing the budgeting process. I mean, they all get together and talk about stuff and they all realize the most important factors that we have to deal with is uh, good water. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we're, we're aiming for it and we will get there and that's good wastewater treatment and stormwater management. Those are the most important things for this community to uh, get right because that's all underground before we put all kinds of nice pretty things on top of all that we need to make sure that's all been renewed because some of that stuff on the ground most of that stuff is over 60 years old now so uh, part of the budgeting process is uh, balancing the wants and needs and most of the needs right now are, are underground so we, we have to be very cautious for that but we also need to have a happy uh, happy neighborhoods, happy residents, and uh, most people are looking for other things like parks, and recreation, and uh, activities. So oh, thank you. Hi. Hi. So that's always the biggest part of the, of the budgeting process. You know, even us as counselors come to the table, we all love to see dog parks and fancy new swing sets everywhere and all that kind of stuff, but we realize that those things can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars themselves, and we have to put some of those hundreds of thousands of dollars into the infrastructure that's underground first. So, um, that's almost enough for, for me, but I did write a mayor's report and realizing that not all people that are watching on YouTube or that uh, have come to this meeting will read the whole document. I am going to read this because I'm quite proud of what I wrote. <laughs> if I may say so. <laughs> but also because I'm quite proud of this town, as I'll go back to what I, where I started here, it wasn't looking that bright, even though it was a home for some of you folks that are sitting in the room. Um, we're really, we're a downturn of the forest industry and we're struggling to find a way forward into what we wanted to be. There were lots and lots and lots of uh, vacant buildings and I, I challenge anybody to find more than two or three in town now. So 
that's a that's a huge sign that uh, people are coming to town with confidence that this is the place to invest in the business. My mayor's report, this uh, annual report, is I am proud to present to you the Town of Lake Couch in 2021 annual report. Council, management, and staff of the town have again done their very best stewarding the finances and operations of the municipality. This past year, Mayor and Council focused on and adopted a strategic plan that will guide the municipality through to 2026 and beyond. I'm very proud of this document as it serves as a menu of what priorities are most urgent to complete and helps guide the budgeting process. I'm sure we all have noticed a significant increase in residential development in and around the town in recent times. Much of this has been planned for many years, and now many new homes are being built. We are also starting to see significant improvements along our main street, which is bringing vibrancy back, vibrancy back to our commercial district as most empty storefronts are once again occupied. Underneath all the progress we see on the surface, the most important aspects of the health of a municipality are good quality drinking water and good stormwater and wastewater management. The municipality must continue to focus on these underground surfaces in the coming years. 2021 also saw us navigate through a pandemic, a mass vaccination program, Aspen atmospheric rivers, a heat dome, no growth logging protests, bumper tourism season, a residential development boom, and an increase in homelessness. We persevered as a community and managed to navigate all of these significant issues. I can tell you from experience, there was a lot of work going on behind the scenes helping keep things safe and calm. On behalf of myself and the rest of council, I wish to thank all the people on the front lines, healthcare workers, police, fire and ambulance staff, as well as municipal staff in all departments for all the extra effort it took for us to navigate the unique events of the year 2021. Finally, I would like to thank the residents of the town of Lake College for the support and trust that you instill upon your elected officials. I know from working with each member of council, the very best interest of the community is being served by making govern governance decisions. That's my report. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to any members of the council um, if they'd like to make comments on what we have to discuss today. I just want to thank staff um, and all our departments and whatnot overall working together to basically bring. Um, projects up front um, that are cost effective and a high pro what priorities prioritizing uh, uh, many of the projects going on around town and uh, with all new developments going on um, we're very busy and again thanks staff for this financial report thank you councillor sandy i too would like to thank staff the uh, office staff public works um, summer staff and uh, the Clack and Lakeview staff, as well as the Info Center staff. They're all working quite well. I visit some of them from time to time, and uh, they're doing a good job, especially with the gardens and things. They're, they're doing a great job and, uh, and keeping the town looking nice. And uh, for the financial report, I'm not a financial person, but it, it's really a, a concise report. And I learn more from our financial officer every Pretty well every month I learned something new and uh, I think you've done a wonderful job in keeping us in uh, in good stead with uh, our finances. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Councillor Austin and Councillor Bomack. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that when I go through the, uh, yeah, that's why I remember my name. <laughs> <laughs> Some <laughs> days it's There's challenging. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh <-oh. laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just me, but, but the dis dysfunctional. <laughs> um, you know, I, when I read through the report, and I get a lot of new people in Lake Cowichan that come into my business, and then we chat about me being on council, and, and it makes you feel proud to see people moving here from other communities that are making Lake Cowichan their home, and, and they love our little community. And, and they pick out all the good things as to why they moved here. And it gives you a sense of encouragement because sometimes you think, oh my gosh, people want a dog park. They want this, they want water and all these different things. And then you have, you know, you look at it from somebody else's perspective and they're going, you guys are trying. Like you got a nice little community here that you should be proud of. And then you go, you know what? We're on the right track. 
And I always say to people, if you want grant lotteries and have a lot of money, we could fix all these things, but we, we you know, realistically, you can't fix everything with the tax base that we have. And when you start to explain this to people, they're, they're quite receptive of it and they understand. And so even residents here tonight and the staff that works with a limited budget, fellow counselors and at the table we do, we have want list and need list. And um, it's so nice that the community pulls together and understands that we all have your best interest at heart and we're trying our best. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Austin, or Lamaca. <laughs> and thank you all for, for your comments tonight. Um, you know, this is no easy job sitting in these positions and being elected. And if it was really easy, there'd be a lineup of the door every time we had an election. There is an election coming up October 15th. So uh, we'll see if how long that lineup is. <laughs> um, you know, just reflecting back on what the councillors have said and, and communications I've had with staff over the past almost two years now. Um, you know, we're in a place now where we're, we're transitioning into a, a larger municipality with all the, the developments taking on, we're taking on here. And things are gonna change even more as we move forward in the next five years. So um, residents need to be aware of that as well. Like, it's funny that when I said that was, that some development's been on the books for many, many years, like, the uh, Trails Edge has been going to be developed since I moved here 25 years ago. And so there's people that moved in on Boundary Road that are still saying, what's going on over there? How come nobody told me? Well, it's, it's, it's been on the cusp of, for many years and now it's becoming uh, more advantageous for developers to, to build here because of the prices of, uh, of the lots and the prices of the homes. So it's, it's a good sign. Another thing I'd like to mention too, um, you know, a lot of us have conversations in the community and um, people come to us with their thoughts and wishes and, and complaints and, and, you know, we, we field them all and I know the town staff does as well. And, and we may not always agree when we're out in the public and, and we're, we don't always agree when we're at the table, but we always walk away with four or five or five heads that are with the good advice of staff and with the knowledge we gain from the public, we put it all together and I think we come up with some pretty decent decisions on, on what to do. But, but you know what, it's pretty easy when we know our underground infrastructure has to come first. So um, there's not a lot left over. And, and what was mentioned was 85, over 86.5% like of our tax revenue is taken, received from residential home owners. Um, it would be really nice if we had a crop and pulp mill in our neighborhood. We could collect an extra $3 million um, to uh, bump up the coppers, but we don't. So we, we really have to uh, nickel and dime stuff and put the money where it's really needed first. So with that, I'd like to uh, open the floor for public input. And uh, if we could just uh, use uh, rules of order here and, and raise your hand, please staff at any time, chime in and I'll probably be calling on you if we get some questions that we can't feel up here. So if there's anybody in the audience that would like to uh, make comments, Sorry, just uh, Councilor McGonagall, is that anything to attend tonight? Is that the minor baseball, the award tonight? Okay, thank you. Um, out there. So um, before we go to William, um, there are copies of this annual report on the town website. So you know, if you look at them there, or if you go under agendas, agenda schedule, look for tonight's meeting that's included in this, uh, in this agenda. Okay, go ahead, William. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I noticed in your, your initial uh, read there how we navigated homelessness. I'm a bit ignorant about this. What have we done towards, or have we just sort of avoided a little bit when you say navigated it? Well, there's uh, community services, and uh, I would say that with a few of the initiatives and the conversations the town has had, um, the, the game has been up where uh, there wasn't a soup kitchen before, and now there is. There's a, there's a location for it and things like that. No, we haven't solved, solved homelessness. But I can tell you right now, neither has uh, many other communities. 
Yeah, I was just curious about how much we've actually put into it, or is it be like the services yeah. for them? Because I don't know where they get their funding from, how much we give them, or it's just federal or provincial funding they get. It's just these things that yeah. we could throw some money at it for whatever reason, and are we? We as a municipality are not. Um, I don't know if I can speak for everybody, but you know, it, it's the province's mandate to send some money down the pipe from that. It's, there's no way the municipality of Duncan, Lake Cowichan, North Cowichan could afford to take on the whole homelessness mm -hmm. issue because as we all know, it's not just a homeless issue. Um, there's many factors that it's usually accompanied with mental health and addiction. addictions. And, and that creates a whole other area. You know, without going being too long-winded about that, we had some, some we had a pretty hard section of winter and, and we tried to figure out how we could make the most impact with nothing. Um, it, it just became evident to me that not every individual is the same in that realm. So, um, and that has been proven time and time again in, in the Duncan area. Sorry, I don't want to get too long later on this, but they did get the pods. They set up the camps, but there were still homeless people. Mm -hmm. The best of the best of those folks, the ones that really caught on to it and responded to the peer support, they got to move into the six, 60 unit uh, or is it 56, doesn't matter, uh, supportive housing unit on Paddle Road behind uh, Home Depot there. Um, and the other camps closed down, except for there's one, the Ramada Inn closed down. And, um, but the best of the best went into that other one that's left, and that's only temporary. And there's over 100 back on the streets in, in Duncan right now. So um, there's no easy solution for this. Be great to have those conversations if anybody wants to sell the bullet. But really, I think it, it does come down to the province putting enough money forward, making it easier for us to solve this, and not just funding stuff for a cabin, but funding the services for those folks who are going to be in there because it just doesn't work for most of the folks. Councillor Austin wants to speak in the back. Just, just had one. Uh, we do give money to community services under the bylaw with CPRB. I think it's thirteen thousand a year. Uh, we do support it that way. And for the homeless pods, having no land to put them on and no services. And uh, when we hear from the RCMP, there's only about three right now that are actually homeless. It, you know, you'd need to, uh, you'd need to have uh, provincial funding. And uh, if we had a lot, if we had twenty or thirty. We generally get a few extra in the summertime, uh, transient more than anything. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and I worked on the soup kitchen. I know William does as did as well, did Darlene as well. And um, they do, a, community services does a lot of work with the people, but unfortunately there, there are a couple of them that are unhousable. They really do not want to be in a house with rules. They don't. And that's the same, uh, the mayor of Duncan will tell you the same thing. There's, I think, 30 or 40 there that they just do not want to be in a place with rules. So, and it's in Victoria and the so we, uh, we do connect with the RCMP. I go on the outreach team with community services every month, and we have different other meetings uh, uh, with tourism as well. We got one this week. So, we do our best with what we have. So, William, I'm going to backtrack because it just came back into my mind. One of the most important things I think happened through all of this is that they, the reaching home dollars from United Way goes to community service as well because they're funded, you get a lot of funding through that and it seems to be continual as long as the need is there. And the hiring of a community navigator for uh, for these folks that, uh, you know, hangs out of the soup kitchen, meets with them on an ongoing basis, it's all the only two days a week that um, that person is open to heading out. I mean, I mean, I've seen that person out in the park just here. Yeah. See if things looking like they're a little bit disheveled, or it's, it's check issue day, and there might be a little bit of supervision needed. You'll head out there and hang out for a while. Because the camera does a good job. Steer people in the right direction. So you know what? That's the most important part of what the positive things that have happened in our Duncan area is that the funding that's come and a whole bunch of volunteers that get together. So I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to sit in one of those pod. Uh, compounds, I'm not using the right word, 
and I'm going to teach art to these folks all, you know, for a few hours a day. Go hang out there and just make a difference because I, one of the things I have learned throughout all this issue, and I don't want to make this whole evening about this, is that you know, these people have a stigma, stigmatism, and we all, well, we all, a large percent of the population will take a wide circle around us and mm -hmm. stop and say hi. But there is also a fair amount of people, and I think there's a lot of them sitting in this room that go up there and help when they can. But for the most part, people take a wide berth around them and look down there and make things have to be changed. And how would, how would that make you feel? So I think by having Cameron there and just nudging the yardsticks a few, a few inches forward, it's, it, it's making a difference. Yeah, it's positive interaction. Mm -hmm. Did you have one more one? No, I was just going to add to what William said because the few that we do have at the end of house are actually quite fortunate, and maybe that's why they don't want to leave our community because we do have ponds in Duncan, and they said, No, we're, we're staying in Lake Couch. And, and I know for a fact when I talked to them that all five members of council have gone down there and checked on them. Do you need food? Are you okay till next week? You know, how are you for? bedding where are you going for something to eat and um, so so they're they're very thankful for that so when i come down they say you know thanks for coming in and checking on me and they tell me the other counselors have been through there and so the mayor is right it's the stigma because then i also have residents come into me and say well just kick them out of town and you're and you're looking here you know, why are we paying for them with our taxes and i'm going because they're a human being that's why, right? And so it's a lot of education too that I think our, our residents need to realize that yeah, there's a reason they're there. I say nobody wakes up saying, I want to be homeless and an alcoholic. You know, we need the services and hopefully there's any limited services in the community we want to be in, but it might help to make them want to transition to getting more, more help down the road. Well, they feel a lot safer here. There's yeah. not the operation from the others that there are in places like Duncan and, and the other larger towns. Yeah. You know, so there is a, they feel safer here. Yeah. So, so tired. If they know people here, people here are looking out for them, you know, right. and buying them breakfast mm -hmm. in BMW or what have you. And people here do look out for those folks. Yeah. There's a whole other background why the core of the Couch and Valley seems to have a few more folks around them. That's a conversation for another day. Happy to have it with the folks who want to hear it. But, um, yeah, another aspect of this, that, you know, there's a step or two above homelessness and it's called poverty. Um, homelessness can be encapsulated there as well. And Councillor Austin was on the Moving On Up Couch Lake um, working group. And now she's stepped back and Councillor Sandu has come on board. And um, we meet monthly now and we've been successful with one round of grants. We've got a second grant now, but we're gonna start taking some actions. We haven't determined entirely what those actions are gonna be, but it's, it's gonna be a little less talking and a few more actions that we can take. And, and I think that the actions that come from this round of funding will help um, alleviate some of the stigmatism. Like one of the conversations we had is, is, you know, we've got a food bank, and I'm not criticizing the food bank, it's on the main street. And we make people that need those services line up on the street. Personally, I think another solution would be just hand over, if you've got food bank donations, hand over a gift card. Made. Let them go shopping like the rest of the people do. Don't make them stand out on the main street with their hand out. Well, that might help break the stigmatism. That's just one of my ideas that I've mentioned at the table, and whether or not it, it catches hold or not, uh, I don't want to. I want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but go ahead. I had to step back from the poverty reduction because it was just too pokey for me. Uh, I just talk, 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 talk. Nothing ever happened. I just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> but I'm glad that others are still doing it because it's necessary. If you can take the pace, you know, I, I gotta think. I think I can speak for all members there. It started out pretty rocky, and I mean, you were there, darling. Things were like everybody wanted to solve it tomorrow, but they only wanted to solve one aspect of it. Sure. And, uh, 
uh, some people were, were very passionate about it. So it's, that's been the most difficult part is getting to this point now where we can all talk the same language. And so the most important thing we did, which we probably could have done earlier on, was we got a set of uh, policies and, and rules on how we're going to talk to each other. Oh, yeah. Silly little thing, but we didn't want to go the same way like we do with the council. Like we have a code of conduct, we have um, all these things that guide us, but the general public doesn't know. You know, some people just you know, if we we're playing hockey, we'd all be smacking each other around. But you know, <laughs> we're held to a much higher, higher you know, and so we should be. And so that's it. These are good lessons I've always said, and I think every counselor I've ever served with, or staff member, this is this has taught me. Being elected official has taught me to be a much better person overall. Um, integrity just keeps on going up every every at least six months a year that I spend. Oh, I can I can still be better, <laughs> and and we have to be. Right? We're serving serving our individuals. Any more questions? Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, stupid questions. Uh, uh, we're all aware that we're on a inflationary spiral. Uh, I know our taxes in uh, last last year went up on just under 5%. In this year, they're up to 25%. And uh, I know uh, the town has, has associated increases also. And uh, I was wondering, uh, your taxes in this town have gone up from 10 to 17 percent overall during the year. Uh, have your workers gone up more than two percent, which they were at for some time? What kind of contract do you have? And uh, you anticipate uh, your your uh, people being paid increasingly more because. <laughs> Employees aren't going to sit back. The unions aren't going to sit back. Uh, what's your uh, feel on that? So, so, and I'm going to let I'm going to let staff chime in. But I just wanted to say that it, please open this report online and look at it because. We're not the only people responsible for raising taxes. But the RCT nope. cost vote, but the town itself, we we budgeted for last year, for 2020, for a two percent increase, and that actually set us back a little bit. But we did that because of COVID. But we had to make up some of that, so we, we went up 4.5 percent this year, which is which is not the norm, but it's right in there with us and other small municipalities. But we also did X at hundred dollars in the sewer parcel tax and the water parcel tax. So that might put us closer to 17% you were talking about. Yeah. And as far as our, our our union contracts, I mean for as long as I've been around they've been been going up about two percent a year in that neighborhood. Do you think that's something that's going to go up? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. William would know. Um yeah you know what? <laughs> the, and and I, <laughs> <laughs> the labor organized labor has so much power. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll have a, a, a bargaining agreement that gets done. And it's funny, like, you know, uh, without giving away all the secrets of how the chess game works, if North Carolina's contract is up first for the CBRDs and its steel workers, they'll settle. Well, good luck getting our steel workers to settle for anything less. Um, very seldom. Well, sometimes Mr. Fernandez, who helps out with negotiating, um, can, can change it up a bit. But really, it, they once one settles, everybody falls into line. Otherwise, you know, we haven't done it yet. I guess we could have stood stood hot tall one day and said, let well, them go on straight. But that's not the reason. It just shows it. It's, if, if they're all getting 2%, then, you know, it's, it's going to cost more money to settle that. Two percent um, is hardly excessive when inflation is ten percent or twelve or whatever yeah. it is today. Two percent is not excessive. Um, I gotta say that I'm really 
we we get to hear about how things are going with negotiations and stuff and I, i'm really quite uh, in awe of how because you know with with most you not not just ours with everybody's it's the unions coming really hot you know looking for a lot of stuff as a person that's never been a part of one um i'm going holy crow <laughs> i guess i should have been a little more pushy when i was working <laughs> it, it, it's all about horse stealing, you know, horse trading. A bit, yeah. Give a bit, take a bit. And, yeah. Try and find something that everyone is happy with. You, you're not going to please everyone. Yeah. And it's just to do what best you can and yeah. just be a little bit tolerant and talk for what the other side wants or can afford. You know. And, uh, yeah. It certainly so, makes for an interesting process. Yeah. <laughs> well, they always are. Um, staff, did you have any comments on the, the increases that? Help me out there, make it more clear. Yeah, the one thing that people are not aware is assessments are not the same because the increases are all over the map. So people have to also look at what that was compared to last year. If you had a 15% increase in the assessment of the average for Canada, your tax are going to go up that much more. Yeah, I understand the assessment stuff, but the way I see it, assessments getting done this year, inflation is going up. Interest is going higher. House value is weaker. So your house basically your mortgage is going to go up when you're going to be mortgage. Yeah. So raising the tax, I don't know how that's supposed to alleviate like the tax class of people when you love when your house is losing basically value because interest is going higher. That's an answer. I, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> yeah. So you know, and, and part of part of the answer to that. So to what you're you're getting at too is you know what it it costs X amount of dollars to operate the municipality. The municipality is not out there trying to grab cash to to pad anybody's pockets or anything. I mean, if if you want to, and I understand what you're saying. I mean, yeah, <laughs> we wear it too, big time. Yeah, you know? um, yeah, we wear it too. Um, we don't control costs new cost of real estate. We don't assess the real estate. That's done by a, an arm's length agency called BC Assessment. And if there's issues with that, it, it's really, it is up to the onus of the taxpayer to dispute it and say, it should be down, it should go up. I don't know that's gonna happen, but um, you're not happy with that. So that is only one small avenue to, to fight that. But just you know, when I think about this, because Mr. Fernandez can tell you that in my first year in, as elected official, I went in there and I, you know, very distraught about having to raise taxes two or three percent. And I actually took a balloon in with me that day and I started blowing up and I said, Joe, <laughs> this is this year, this is next year. And I said, Joe, you know what's going to happen if I keep blowing on this balloon? It's going to pop. And I think, I think we're seeing a little bit of that now. Our balloon isn't popping, but it sprung a leak because all those high real estate prices are now starting to come down houses houses are not in bidding wars too much anymore and they're not selling as fast so uh, and they raise the interest rate so that's just going to slow down the economy and that's having been through this three times in my lifetime that seems to be the only way to slow this economy down especially and i don't know if there's anybody in this room that can brag about this but the silver tsunami is is just starting to hit us now and there's a whole bunch of wealth as you can tell there's a lot of houses in lake couch and they're going for seven hundred ninety nine thousand dollars, and the people aren't going to be living here. it's just another place a secondary place to live so there's so much money out there floating around that those that's the market that's really driving the economy right now and by raising interest rates and things like that that's federal government's way of saying, whoa, let's calm down here. It's getting carried away. The average folk are not going to be able to afford to do that. No. First time buyer won't be able to buy these no. houses at that interest rate. No. Really, like, they bring it down. Until that wealth changes hands and it gets into those hands, right? Yeah. Right? But inflation, like, to me, seemed like more like a government response to that, like, you know, stop trade, like, from COVID itself, right? So... I don't understand how the taxpayer is supposed to actually make up for like the, the economy that is on that kind of stuff that they try. Right? And that's where it seems like inflation is like it, it's bad decision from government and taxpayer. You know, and, and 
had me myself having been through it three times. This is the third time now I'm watching it happen. Uh, having interest at or around zero <laughs> percent, that's, that's going to cause an issue somewhere along the way. Council Assembly. Well, I just want to say, um, talking when we're doing our budget process, like last year, staff gave us a recommendation and we went against it and we, lo we lowered the tax increase. Um, and we looked at the wishes and the wants. And again, this year, we looked at the wishes and the wants and we looked overall as to what was priority. Probably this, this budget year was probably our toughest. And we had our strategic plan. So we had an idea as to what is the town's highest priority and what do we need to do to get there? A lot of it is grant money, but some of the late work is art from our tax base. So um, our wishes aren't in the budget this year, just the necessities. And that's, I'm proud to say that, that when we passed this budget, it was, the necessities to run this for tw in 2022 and no big splashy anything so yeah, i think uh, a lot of uh, problems with uh, affordability today is completely outside of the town's realm yeah. to be truthful uh, people can complain about taxes complain about uh, things that are being done in the town, but most of it is not a cause of the town at all. Like the hardships, nothing to do with the town. I don't think so. Anymore. And it's everywhere. I watch yeah. American news, it's the same. I mean, if you want to blame somebody, blame the federal government, blame the provincial government. They're the ones that really control all the money in this country. It's not the town. There's, there's a figure that, that I, I throw out on the table that 8% of every tax dollar, I'm going to use myself as an example, 8 cents of every dollar tax dollar comes from my, comes to fund the municipality through property taxes. 8% of all the taxes I pay is all the town has to work with. So that, I know that's another percentage to try and wrap our brains around, but so all the 92% of the rest of the taxes we all pay, GST, PST, and all that, go to the provincial and federal government and other things like that. So, so in order, we're being forced through, in, through uh, the granting process, we have to, I don't want to use the word problem, because that's kind of negative, but we need to apply for grants when they come available and make the best case we can to get a grant, to get some of those, that 92% back to help us out. That's why when you hear a grant lottery, it's because we've got to play that game to do big projects. So there's no way that the town lake couch can afford a $10 million wastewater treatment plant, which is what we're up against. So we've had to apply for the grant. We've got to do some real political work when it comes to UBCM and talk to the ministry. Well, the assembly of, of uh, Towns and municipalities could put up a better fight for the money. I mean, we're just letting the provincial government and the federal government do whatever the heck they want. I mean, they do have power, but the towns and municipalities have to get together and say, hey, this is enough. We have people that are, you know, and, and you know what? Way. That's that's why I think that our Association of Vancouver Island Coastal Communities and the Union of BC Municipalities are a valuable thing that we attend. And we've got UPCM coming up. I think we're we're making appointments for four or five ministers. Um, and then we're definitely do some follow-up ones if we don't get those meetings. Because you get to meet them for 15 minutes and very politely say, this is what we need. We send them a background report before we get there so we know and when can you come and visit because we need to talk about this more. And uh, so that's what, that's a game plan we have for, especially for the wastewater treatment plant issue. Uh, and I've been to UBCM probably about eight or 10 times now. And every time we go, we, we pick the most important minister and, and we go in there and we plead our need. And in this particular case, I think we're gonna have to follow up on it really hard after this. Yeah, and we do play hardball. When it came to the water treatment plant, 
the seven point something million dollars. Uh, they wanted us to upgrade it, upgrade our drinking water, and we just said, well, with what? Yeah. You know, it's Island Health that does that push. Okay, then you need to go to the, <coughs> this minister and tell them you need to write the letter, sign it, and say how much how you need to. It. Yeah, it, it's not easy. Uh, it's something that has to be done. And we have to find out where to go to yeah. to apply. That's why the connections with uh, provincial politicians is uh, very valuable. That's why we go to conventions. Because like anything else in life, I know Cliff. I know that if I ever needed a cup of sugar, Cliff's going to lend me a cup of sugar. <laughs> He's going to me. Buy me a whole bag. Probably give me half the shirt off of that <laughs> because I know Flint, right? And so it's important to get to know these people. And our staff does a great job at um, looking into grants for us too. So they're they're continuously trying to find something. So you know we're, we're fortunate for them, and we have been quite lucky with the lotteries. And when I came on council seven years ago, I remember being told. <coughs> So in the municipality, we're to provide water, sewer, and roads. And now all of a sudden, seven and a half years later, it's now you're providing uh, water, sewer, roads, homelessness, health care, housing. There's all these things that are being downloaded because you're right, the federal is pushing it down to provincial, provincial is pushing it down to the smallest person, which is us. And so our residents who are closest to see us with boots on the ground are going, well, fix all of these problems. And we do. We try our best, even though that's not really our job in municipality, but you take it on because you want a good community. So, you know. Well, like I said, if every if municipalities and towns get together on this, you've got a lot more power. Mm -hmm. and, and trying to do it. And Councillor Austin and Sandu and Councillor McGonagall uh, came yeah. back from um, FC Regina. Yeah, yeah, FC now. And point. every community is doing the same thing. We need infrastructure that. money, we need the roads are falling apart, our sewer systems, our, our water systems. And so it's a huge pressure of everybody across Canada saying, you know, we, we need help. And that a part of that I learned um, via at this table is our seven and a half million dollar water treatment plan. But then the government also regulates an asset management pro, uh, program of saying, how are you going to replace that in 25 years? We can't do it to the taxpayers. And that seven and a half million might cost us 15 or 20 million by then. You can never put away enough money or tax enough to have that money sitting there when that needs to be replaced. And it's not just that, it's your sewer and your vehicles, your roadways, everything. So, so there's a lot of uh, pressures on, on governments. Where you get the funding from? Provincial or federal? Or both? Both. Okay. You need money for infrastructure, you say? Pardon me? You need money for infrastructure, so basically sewer roads. Yeah, okay. everything. Because to my understanding, like a provincial government, like uh, county, I guess it was like some money that we still don't know where the, the money is. The provincial government that's supposed to go structural stuff. So basically, what you're talking about and what Mister was saying here, like if you guys start putting yourself together, count to count, then you can basically bring provincial and federal government into account for where the money is going and where not going. And a lot of that too, we have to have money in the bank so yeah. that if we get grants, they want to see a share from us too. Yeah, so basically yeah. a share investment. Yeah. Right. yeah. So are we investing any kind of money from, from we are? Better, better to answer that over there. Any yeah, we. The Municipal Finance Authority is where we invest our funds with. Okay. We get the best rate of interest from them. Okay. So in the annual report, that you able to see all this kind of contract from the CDL where we invest in money and how we package it. Yeah. Yeah. 
And what, what would that be in the website? Because I've been trying to find it for you. And I find it usually should be in public notice, which I don't see it in public notice. If you go under the um, finance tab yeah. and scroll down to the very bottom, it'll have the annual report for the last three years. Okay. Yeah. So that would be in the on the town's website under finance. So excuse me again. Under the town's website, yeah. under, you go to the finance tab. Okay, I see only service area information using online service. So that be, I can show you that at the end of the meeting. Yeah, right? that'd be great. Why are they all starting for that? I wonder if this gentleman was wondering where the uh, COVID recovery infrastructure funds were or if they've been used or. I, I didn't hear him ask that question. There is, no, he didn't also, ask it that way, but that's what I Yeah, so basically, I like, it's like basically, federal government asked like about two million, two million dollars that we don't know where it went. Yeah, so that was from the time with McKenna before she resigned her, her position as a Mr. Researcher, I guess she was something in, in the matter. But yeah, it was kind of bit of money that we didn't know where it was. At the same time that the we charity kind of like all scenarios oh, yeah. going at the same time. Well, you won't find that in this. <laughs> no, yeah, I understand. Yeah, but if you guys are relying on this kind of money from federal and provincial government, it'd be a nice question for you guys to be asking. Because I, I can't go and go ask people like you guys can, who you guys have more access to do that. No. Good comment. And um, as far as the, the COVID uh, restart grant funding, it, it is all it is listed in here. And there's about four hundred twelve thousand dollars left, I believe, of that money. Okay. I don't have that document. Page thirty-five of the annual report. Under finance, in the town web. Or we can even look at it while you're here. Couldn't find it earlier. <laughs> no, thank you. Anybody else? Right. Uh, one of the things that I really noticed uh, since I moved to town, which is 13 years ago, that the beautification projects around town are really going ahead. And uh, it really irks me that the town who should be leading the way their building is not yet underway. Secondly, it's a terrible eyesore. <laughs> it hasn't been dated for God knows when. And uh, I know there you have a, a you the council has made uh, uh, approval of uh, renovations. To yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop you before you go too far, and I don't want you to feel silly. Um, <laughs> it's well underway. Yeah, well underway. Where? Uh, I, you've got to. You'll have to go walk around. I could tell you that they've taken the whole back end off, and because it's a renovation and it has to be up to code, they've gone underneath. They've anchored the building so it's earthquake proof now, and now they're putting in the steel girders that are going to form part of the roof for the new council chambers. Yeah, so it's it's we're we're knee deep into it. And plus, they dug a, an eight foot hole to make it uh, so that it's not going to fall in the river ever again. So, yeah, it's well underway. Okay. Um, well, it certainly doesn't look like. <laughs> yeah. So, the uh, office. Yeah, staff. Yeah, good, good call there. Staff is moving into the uh, old credit union building in July because they need to get out of there. So. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of the work's been underneath and stuff mm -hmm. repairing because you can just imagine trying to marry up new construction with old construction and you know, the things they've had to do. And that's what that's just removed on all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, we've so, all sat there, even ourselves, saying, Well, why is it moving along this? Because there's so much work. Everybody that's been in there and spent an hour or two in there knows that there's a lot going on <laughs> underneath. And it's starting to show in the back end now. Today, they just put in one of the girders. Then go have a look around. Yes, yeah. just go. They won't lay underneath. <laughs> so, well on its way. Yeah. Yeah. They're looking at a completion of uh, the end of this. So we've got to make sure you have a hot hat on. Hard hat. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't go in the daytime. 
Your white one. <laughs> I got a white one. I <laughs> so that's exciting. It would be very exciting. Mm -hmm. We've all wanted it done for how many? 10, 15 years. Yeah. It's slow. Everything's slow. I want everything done yesterday. That doesn't happen. And again, no more for it's been years of putting money away. Putting money away. So that that's previous council. So and staff in in their directing, you know, council and, and how to do this and uh, and that's that's uh, this kind of money. Two point six million. A lot of money that many years to save it but here we are finally so you know what the interesting thing that gave me confidence in local government financing and things like that not so much of the regional district they, they have a different way of doing things but here you know we could have very easily taken that 1 million or 2.6 whatever it is in that account and say well let's go spend it on sewer let's go spend it on this or that the other thing or a brand new park or something but you know, when when councils decided 21, 22 years ago now to start putting away that money, we've honored that resolution and kept on putting it away until we have enough to do this job. Rather than just turning on a dime and say, well, we promised you a new town hall 20 years ago, but the heck with it, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna do something. So that, that's, you know, and especially in municipal government, I just find that the finances have a very high level of integrity as far as how the money gets spent. At least in this municipality and the ones that in I intended to put our neighbors in. And I'll go back to that before I was on council. I would look at it too and go, why are they spending all this money on a town office? Seriously, slap a coat of paint on, be done with it. Then when I went into the office and you see the girls with sweaters on because they're cold in the winter and there's no air conditioning there in the summer. And in your understanding, it was a fire hall. And you're looking and you're thinking, you know, you have to be mindful that you have staff working there. We only go in there for a meeting on a Tuesday, but they deserve a workplace that's free of asbestos and warm and inviting. And uh, anybody, you know, deserves a good workplace. And it's the same thing too, that the next thing to look at is the public works building. And you look at there and you're going, oh my gosh, right? They, they don't complain, they go to work every day, but I think they all deserve, you know, somewhere to be proud of to go to work every day. And so it's not our council building that we want, it's for our staff. Okay, so we have a I know that uh, you know not everybody's probably seen all the reasoning behind every answer you've heard tonight, but uh, you know what? That's I do want you to know that uh, the counselors and myself, we all listen to everything that we, we get told um, by the public, by staff, and we put it all on our thinking caps. And, you know, each in our own way comes up with the best, you know, best opinion on an issue we can. And we work together. It's, if it was all up to me, things would be a heck of a lot different. It's just like it was all up to uh, any any one of these councillors, um, decisions would be a heck of a lot different than they are. But we work together and we come to a consensus. And when we pass motions, but sometimes we don't all put up our hands and support and for. But you know what? We accept what's given. We, but above all, I guess my message is we appreciate the input from. Mm -hmm. anybody so please don't hesitate to reach out if you want to talk to us and we'll tell you like i felt when i we did the public meeting i didn't give a lot of answers and i, I kind of felt like a federal politician but you know because all i can do is tell you the, what the decision was and i can tell you why we made that decision and whether you agree or disagree that's what happened and then we move forward and i still stand by that i have never been a party to a lot of any bad decision it's always worked out in favor of the greater good, which is the public good. That sounds like really close to answer, but that's not something I truly believe in. And I'm proud to be a part of that process. And yeah, I learned in my first or second year how to take to the criticism of the public. It was hard for a while, but nobody likes that stuff. 
But you learn to you learn to navigate. Then came Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I, I just wanted to comment that uh, I admire all of the counselors and the mayor for Mayor Bob for what work they do because it is a thank, thankless job in many ways. And uh, and just to get up there and do your best and to you know follow your follow your uh, moral values. I think that's very important. And I think you're doing a good job. I I I can see that this town has made a lot of progress. Thank you. Appreciate that. We don't get a lot of letters like that. <laughs> oh, you want a letter? <laughs> <laughs> you would definitely write it on Facebook. Put it in, a, put it in, in a text or an email, no, or it never goes really anywhere. Is, <laughs> I'm just going to say we did just fly. We did just, oh, yeah, it's on, it's on the owl. Um, going to the FCM or the UBCM, I've never been to one before. And the FCM is a federal municipalities, and you learn such a lot. Uh, you go to these clinics and things, there was one on municipal funding and all sorts of different things that we went to, and you get overloaded. We've got books. Christine and I write a lot of notes. And then we have to look it over later and, and remember what we learned. But all the communities from Newfoundland to up north to, to BC, everyone that we met, and they all have the same kind of things going on. You know, taxes and, and infrastructure. And uh, it was really neat to meet big, huge towns and little small towns. Of, one of them I looked at today in Quebec was 570 people, and, and they still had to pay for everything. And that's not very many people. So. Really, I love going to those things. You really learn a lot and, uh, and learn how to govern property because when you first start out in this job, you, you're kind of going, what do I do now, right? That first that first year. So, uh, That's why there's training. Yes, and we love it. Our first training session is usually within a month or two and telling you how to actually be a counselor and a mayor because you don't, you don't really know at first. And uh, no, it's wonderful. I love it. Yeah, most folks think they're going to come in here and change the world over you know, I, I think we could be. No, I'm not going to say Trump, um, <laughs> but I think we could be thankful that it was a process. And one of the my favorite sayings is lo the local government or any government is a process. It's not just something one person can walk up and push that red button. Things are going to happen. That's the job I want. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be run through a process of policies and bylaws. This is Putin. <laughs> <laughs> and then the five heads sitting around the table with whatever advice they get. That's always helpful when they, they give us the, uh, the bottom line. And we appreciate that. We appreciate all you do for the town and uh, how much of your own time you give. I was just thinking of those meetings, Carolyn. I know I know you love them. And, but that's an area that maybe some residents have been critical of. Yeah. But I, I don't think that's fair. Even if it's just a perk, you'll deserve that. A perk, because you don't certainly get overpaid for your, the hours you put in. So I think that's just an aside. I, I think you do a great job with what you have to work with. Talking about staff? You get paid enough. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and you're right too, Darlene, because people don't see that other side. They go way out the deal. You get paid all this money. And you show up at a meeting on Tuesday. Yeah, no, they don't and see all the they don't see the in. emails at home, the phone calls, the people you know coming and stopping you in the grocery lineups and talking to you and asking questions. And Facebook, I think most of us learn very quickly just to stay off your yeah. Facebook. Yeah. And there's a reason for it. And, and it's not that because people are uh, critical. I find that if you're not on Facebook looking at it, you can have a, a better outlook. Yeah. But I'd rather a person come to see me personally and ask the question than to, I, I won't react to a different community site to the yeah. Yeah. stay away from yeah, yeah. and it's just like the delete, 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 delete <laughs> right? Just because I, I don't like to see that negativity in our community. I'd rather talk to people and, and uh, inform them, you know, of the right answer. And, and one of the things that um, the conferences we've gone to this year is talking about like the online 
um, attacks, not just on um, municipal, like council people, but staff also. And, um, you know, what is our role as a council to, um, when say a member of our staff is being harassed or whatnot on, on social media, right? Well, we do have as a council a responsibility to protect our, our staff, every staff member, every employee, everybody. And, um, and, and sometimes you just, you see something, you just have to say, I, I, I just, I, I, you know, and, and it's hard because you want it, you want to answer these things, but you know, it's going to implode into something. Well, that you can't hold. jump in. No. Okay. So you just have to let, <laughs> let but, no but, but I, like we've all said, we have <coughs> phones, we have emails, we have health addresses, you know, <laughs> if you have a question or something, then contact us that way. And then you'll get, hopefully, the answer you're looking for. If we can't give you the answer, we'll find the answer for you. But detailing this on social media is not, not the answer. And, and that's something we all got this year with, especially with COVID. And we're all home and we're all just, you know, holy crow, right? It, it became overbearing some days. So. But also, too, if people would ask a question rather than make a statement, like saying the town hall is not getting done, right? <laughs> you know, ask a question. Is the town hall getting done? Or or is the grass getting cut over there? Or is this getting done? If they ask the question, you can answer it. But when they make a statement, and I don't go on Facebook very often, people have to tell me things. Then there's like 20 comments down below all about this statement that wasn't true, right? And they built on it. And so you really don't want to go near. So just ask the, ask the question. You know what's happening, you, and you did ask lots of good questions tonight. And there's more, I'm sure, when you get to look at this. Well, a lot of people don't understand that a lot of the questions they have, they can go to the public works to get the answer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but, but I think yeah. sometimes they don't really want answers. They no. just want to. They're venting. They're venting. They're venting. Yeah. You know, I, I learned to, especially during COVID, <laughs> um, that each one of those community groups is a coffee shop. If, if I want all the best advice in the world, I'm around the room making sure. Um, I'll go to the A and W every morning at six a.m. Yeah. Yeah. Every and I'm and they're the greatest people because I camp with them. But they're my they're my friends, but um, they've all got all the answers there for fifty years or more. Yeah. They all been going there. And you know what? I'm not years. saying they're wrong either, <laughs> right? But you know what? I'm yeah, not at the A and W, so I don't interfere with their conversations, and that's how I look at these. Community groups now, where they where they get. I very seldom dive in there. Um, to share my own page, the mayor's page, or my own page, or something like that. Uh, because I don't want to. I feel like you know. I said, okay, I'm intruding on their world because they want to live it there. That's fine. You know, I've always based based my decisions or, or uh, the things that get done is, is who shows up in person, ready to do the work. And tonight, it's you folks on this side of the room. You showed up. This, 3,000 other people that could have been here tonight. That's pretty small group. None of them, none of them are engaged. And it's been this, this is actually a fairly large group compared to most years. Some of the, some of the years we wonder why we held this meeting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like three people. Yeah. 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 yeah, but you know what? With the that thing right there is called an owl. That's when I speak, it points at me, and and the rest of us are on the screen over there and it's being broadcast on YouTube. And I think does it get the audience too? Uh, not this time, it's just all you. Yeah, so so with the advent of all this technology because of COVID now, we can get those those these meetings out there on YouTube. You can watch it live or it's a three minute lag time, but it's also there archived as well for whenever you want to watch it. So that's, we find that the viewership is probably three or four the night of the meeting, but we look at it a week later, it could be up to 60 people have watched it at their, at their leisure. It's like the Netflix of local politics, I guess. Watch what they want. Maybe that's not I really good like ideas. <laughs> maybe, maybe if you want, yeah, if you want to see it, come to the meeting. Yeah. No, but, I yeah. like the electronic. I like the digital meetings. Even yeah. for any, yeah. any day, like a couple of days later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really boring. If I just fast forward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just, yeah. I'm just making sure. I know. I know. <laughs> None of it's boring. Really. Never. Oh. <laughs> okay. No, it's it just because. When you think about any issue that's coming forward, and, you know, like we get started on something and people say, Well, I didn't know anything about that. Um, so I thought, What do we do? Put an ad in the paper? Uh, you don't get the paper. You know, uh, do we send a, do we send a, 
an email? Well, we can't send an email to everybody. You have to sign up for the email. We can't dig out your email off or something. Do we call you? Uh, do we come knock on your door to tell you, you know, when these important, like that subdivision going in? Yeah, everybody should be knowing that's what that's going to happen, or that your town is growing by 100 units. Um, or should we just send something in the mail every day? Well, you can just imagine all the work in that. So this just it doesn't give, this just gives us a way to say, well, we, we're doing everything we can to keep you informed. If you're not, the public has a role to play in this too. They got to own this. It's their town. Yeah. So that's why I'm happy about that. Because I can always say, all you got to do is what you do. Turn on the siren. It's <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> beautiful. <laughs> that your attention. The meeting started. <laughs> oh, I like that. Then they come yelling at me to shut it off. <laughs> For us to shut it off. Yeah. Anybody else? We, we had a good little session tonight. It seemed very informal, but I think it's it's. Uh, is it our planning to hire more staff? Yeah, in the future, or um, the answer would be yes. And just to give you an example, like if you looked at our budget, it would probably say we budgeted ten million dollars. That wasn't all our money. That's grant money that we think we're going to get. That's transfers from other government, but we the only thing we can rely on for sure is our is our residential property tax revenue, okay, which is about four two point three million, just over. Huh? Just over two point three. What well, was four million? <laughs> when I read that one, yeah. including, including the one and two other services. Oh, okay. So yeah. so <laughs> then, <laughs> then that don't I don't want to go too far off here. So so how much of that is waste? Just over a million bucks. Yeah, so half of our property tax revenue is goes out into wages. So it's an running one point seven million. Yeah, running a municipality is not a cheap business because of the, the labor union um, rates and stuff like that. And those are good jobs and we shouldn't shouldn't uh, we shouldn't be underpaying people to do those kind of jobs if we want to attract the best people and those are the hardest jobs. On the market these days is digging ditches being on the front lines and stuff like that so and you know what uh, i've heard you hear well, i'm going to pick on joe but i'm going to throw it out there people say caos are are getting way too much money and directors of finance and public work superintendents but you know what that's the going rate around the province and, and uh and some of them are one a whole lot higher than they are for us so. I doubt that person at the top is doing uh, any more work than that, than what our CEO does, right? Because we we would all love to hire one or two extra people to work in that department, but and four or five more for the public works. But you know, it's, it's nowadays in municipal government anywhere, it's a hundred thousand dollars a person a year after all the benefits are in it. Probably six to a hundred thousand dollars a year. So that can add up pretty quick. Twenty-two thousand dollars when you were at that public meeting is a one percent tax increase. Twenty-two thousand dollars will buy you a casual employee who works one day a week. Maybe. So, yeah, we will. We can afford it. Yeah. Well, one in town employee, or you get five counselors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can knock us down to two or three counselors. Well. We don't make enough to save a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> it would cut into your money if you had another counselor. We don't I say, don't worry, I think I put all mine back on property taxes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Any staff members want to make a comment? Does anybody want to look at the report? Um, if you're interested in learning about tax revenue, um, if there's pie charts, starting at page 47, which tells you all about the taxes that we collect and what it goes towards, you know, what, if, what taxes we collect for other municipalities. And um, of your tax bill, less than 45% of that is kept by the town. The rest is paid out to other jurisdictions. So we're acting as a flow through entity. And um, that's all outlined here. And very easy to see 
format for anybody that's interested. So that was something that I wanted to make sure got out there too. There's some very good graphics in there, which makes uh, makes the document easy to read. So. I, I've I've got one question in that regards to homeowners grant. Uh, as far as I'm aware, they've been going up over the years, but this year they decreased by a substantial amount. Yeah. Homeowners grant de decreased by 12 per by 12 percent. Do you know the rationale behind that? And everything went up uh, 10, 17 percent. But that's the only thing that came down. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. Um, you're saying the number of people claiming a homeowner grant? No, no. The amount. The amount. No, the homeowner grant is the same. It's 1,045 people over 65. Oh, well, relatively, it's, for relatively, it's come down. What percentage? Of? It's the same as it has been for quite a number of years. Yeah, but it would say it say it was a thousand last year, and now. Our, you mean well, your total taxes? I've gone up oh, and so it, it never and oh, the, it the never. homeowner grant is saying saying yes. Um, yeah. and it's yeah. an amount determined by the province, not yes, the I understand that. And um actually we're fortunate, we're considered rural. If you're in Victoria, your seniors grant is 770 and your regular grant is only 570. So because we're rural, ours is higher. But that's a good point. Thanks for clarifying, Ronnie, because that's something to think about, maybe conversations that can be had. Problems to have increased assessments. Like we have like 45% this year, 46. Over 45%. Yeah, then, yeah, like not everybody paid a whole bunch more taxes, but like, like Mr. said that if you're if your increase was above the average, yeah, you got taken. Yeah. It's been tough. I mean, like, like I said, I've done tax bill too. I don't know why. I'm on a fixed income. <laughs> 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 I, I, was say, you <laughs> I, I tell some of the people that are on a fixed income, and I, I've been doing it for a few years now, is I pay on mine every month $125 or $150. You kind of don't miss it. And if you pay it every month, and I do that with the water and sewer. In fact, I overpaid this year. Um, so I put that down a bit. But that does really help, and you just do it online. And then when you get your bill, and I think I still had to pay nearly $800 as well. So, yeah. 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 It does help with people on fixed income. Because you, kind of, you kind of don't miss it, but once it's gone, it's gone. Right? What cash flows out monthly instead yeah. of? It's kind of budget, it's a way of budgeting. Yeah. Yeah, when mine came in at about 2300 I went, oh crap. And then when my friend in Yugo told me hers was over 5000 Yeah. Mm -hmm. They went up 100%. Mm -hmm. Wow. Dr. Leckie's yeah. property went up 100% at Main Street. 100% more taxes because of what's going on in Yugo. Did his assessment go up that much or his property tax? Well, he up? was telling my husband it was his property taxes, but I think he meant his assessment. He might he? have meant his assessment. Yeah. Because his assessment. But his property tax also went up because of it. Yeah. He's, he's starting a class action suit. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. and people well, up in the slopes now, their houses were. One of my friends up there has a beautiful home. It's assessed at over a million, and they were they were uh, going again, you know, going to the assessment authority. They can't do anything about it. That's what it is. That's what it's worth, and it, it probably is a beautiful home right up on the mountain. But again, so and that's in our town, so that puts everything else up as well, right? That being said, we live in a beautiful country, mm -hmm. and we have a really good standard of living. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to compare Canada and the United States, maybe Canada with, with countries and maybe a, have a conversation with Joe one day or something, somebody who's from another country where they do collect property taxes, and, but they obviously have a lower standard of living. These are the kind of things I think happen when we live in such a worldly country. I think things can get out of whack. 
I have two children that left this country because of that. Two other countries, and they're doing quite well. Which where did they go? Where they go? One's in Taiwan, oh. the other one's in North Korea. Yeah, you have to watch. And the there's not near as much red tape. Yeah. If you want to earn a living. My son's and, in Thailand, same thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah, partly taxes, yeah. partly COVID, partly our ridiculous governments. Yeah. And my my son went to university, uh, commerce degree. Oh. Oh, wow. so, 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 and my oldest son, as soon as he got out of university, he left this country and said, I am not going to pay the tax that this yeah. country wants me. You know, that's. That's somebody right out of university. All right. So, so I hear some uneasiness in the back of the room. So, I think we've, uh, we've probably covered this enough. Thank you very much for the great, great conversation. It's good that we can uh, help impart some understanding of what's going on, with how we work, and how we arrived at this annual report. Thank you again, staff, for producing this. Guiding this council through this. And once again, another successful year, despite all the uh, things that were going on around us. We did okay. So, with that, I'd like to call for adjournment of this annual general meeting. Um, Councillor Austin, seconded by Councillor Momaka. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>